a whole burnt offering. And I want to start by reading a familiar scripture in Hebrews. Very familiar. Wayne, I think, just recently spoke about or out of this scripture. It's Hebrews chapter 6, the first verse. It's where I would like to begin with the scripture. Hebrews, sixth chapter, first verse. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Verse 2 of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permit. In that first verse, the first verse of Hebrews chapter 6, there's two words that it says there. It says leaving, and then it says, rather more than two words, but it says leaving and then going on unto. Leaving and going on unto. And part of what my message or what my message is about today is the Christian life, of course. But how God calls us to leave places and go on to other places. It's about how he calls us on. And there's a word in this verse, another word that I haven't mentioned yet. It says going on unto the word perfection. And that's a word that we're a little bit afraid of, the word perfection. And I think it's partly because we misunderstand what the word means, and it's also because we understand how much of a failing people that we are at times and the things that face us in life. And we look at that and it wants to stumble us, and so we say things like, well, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. But is that biblical? I understand what people mean when they say those words, and I'm not here to be critical about that. I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. Yes, I understand that. But how does God look at us when we're in Christ? And why does the Bible here tell us to go on to, unto a place that is called a place of perfection? If we as Christians are not called to be in a place of perfection, I think we have to understand what that word means, what the word perfection means, and who we really are in Christ. There is, some, there is, there, there is a mindset that we as Christians have to also understand, and I think it's something that hinders us at times. Talks here about going on, like I mentioned, that there's a leaving and that there's a going on. And part of what I see and understand by that is that the Christian life is a place of going on and of moving. It is never a place where we can, in a sense, where we can relax. I understand that we rest in Christ. We find a place where we understand that He's the one and that we rest in Him. But also the Bible speaks a lot about never coming to a place where we can relax, where we can take our ease, where we can let off. In fact, the Bible speaks to us, and it says that we are to always watch and to always pray, and that we are to always be diligent. We are to be a diligent people, always looking out, because there is no place where we can come to, where now it's on easy street, and we put it on automatic, and we roll along. There's no place like that, Brother Pete. I've not found a place like that. In fact, the Bible instead tells us that there is an endurance that we have to endure, even unto the end. There's a striving, not a striving in the flesh, but that there is a mindset that we as Christians, in fact, the Bible says that we are to have the mind of Christ, armed with the mind of Christ, that we understand the world is against the, the people of God. We are gathered together here today as worshipers of God. 
We're here because we love God. I trust you're here because you love God, because you set your heart to follow after Jesus, to be a disciple of Him, and to walk after Him with all of your heart. I trust that's why you're here this morning. I trust you're not here this morning because you just came to see each other. We do that. We fellowship together. In that, understand that the world is opposed to the believers in Christ. To those who truly throw themselves into the arms of God and seek after Him with all of their heart, let me tell you that there is an opposition. We don't need to concentrate on it. That's not what my message is about. But understand this, that when we seek and set ourselves to follow after God with all of our heart, most of the world and the world system and what the world is all about is opposed to those who truly believe and throw their heart through and, and, and put their faith in Christ. Even though the work has been completed in Christ, it must be made reality in you and me. What do I mean by that? The promise was given to Abraham in Genesis that there would be a land. God promised to him and to his descendants the land of Israel, which was at that time the land of Canaan. And God promised to Abraham that that land was his. That that was his land. And it was to be his land and the land of his descendants. Abraham never really occupied that land. He lived in it, but he never occupied the land as a whole. But it was his land, it was a promise to him, and it was a promise to his descendants. Abraham and Isaac. Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Jacob had the 12 tribes. And then they were in captivity. Just follow me here for a little bit. And then they were in captivity for a while in Egypt. And there became under the bondage of Pharaoh and were slaves for not sure what the period of time was, for quite a number of years, some hundreds of years, I believe. Until God heard their cry and heard their cry come up into his ear of, of how they were under the, the boot of Pharaoh. And he heard their cry and he sent a deliverer and he sent Moses to deliver them and to take them over into the land of the, of the promise. This was their land. This was Abraham's land. And yet they were not occupying it yet. The enemy was occupying it. Abraham led the children of Israel out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and up to the Jordan River. And from there Joshua took them on. And Moses was on Mount Nebo, and he saw over into the land that he, they were to occupy. And then God spoke to Joshua, and he said, Joshua, after they crossed the, the Jordan River, and the, the river separated God talked to Joshua and he said, Joshua, this is the land that you are now in that I promised Abraham your father. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, that's your land. That's your land. Every place that you walk, every place that you're willing to go, Every place that you're willing to follow me and listen to my voice and that you, that you go with the children of Israel, I'll be with you. But you've got to go and you've got to put your foot on that land. You've got to put your foot on that place. And the enemy has to be driven out. Now that does not match with our way of thinking. That doesn't match with my natural understanding. This was Abraham's land. This was what God gave to Abraham and to all his descendants. And today we see the, the Jewish people in Israel occupying most of that land. Maybe not all that was there, but it, it will be. 
In my natural mind, my mind wants to say, well, if you've given me something, why do I need to walk it? Why do I need to tread on it? Why do I need to go after it? And so there's a tendency for us to want to just sit back. Not understanding. Some of the things that we go through and some of the things that, that God takes us through because of the life that has been born into us by the way of Christ and by the way of the Holy Spirit. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, that was the word that was unto Joshua. We're born again through the blood of Jesus. I think, trust that most of you in here have had a, an experience with Christ. You've come to a place where you realized your need and you, were, you came to a place where you realized your sin and you confessed your sin, you received Christ into your life, and your sins were washed away, and you experienced the forgiveness of the blood, the forgiveness of Christ. And this is where the work of Christ begins in our life. He begins to take us to places and to occupy the land that is who we are. If I can somehow draw the picture of what I want you to understand, Leaving Egypt was the beginning, not the end. It was the beginning. God wanted to take them not only out of slavery, but to occupy a land that was theirs, that was promised to Abraham, that was promised to his descendants, and is theirs today. What does that mean to you and I? There's a land. There's a land of promise. There's a land that God wants us to occupy. Sometimes I remember early on in my Christian experience, early on in my Christian life, I had a wonderful experience. I experienced freedoms that I had never experienced before. If you can imagine the children of Israel after they crossed the Red Sea and they sang the song and they saw the deliverance. And I could imagine knowing how my own life has been. I could imagine that they, said they were on the other side of that bank and they saw the Egyptians floating in the water and they said, wow, from now on it's easy street. We've been delivered. From now on, we just need to stick the rod out or whatever they might have said. And they rejoiced in that. But you notice not very far along when things got a little bit tough and a little bit hard and maybe they didn't have the water that they wanted and they didn't have the manna or they didn't have the food that they wanted. They began to think again of the things that they had in Egypt. But God was taking them to a place of fulfillment and of promise. A land called Canaan or a land of promise and then later called a land of milk and honey. Again, in our minds... It ought all be easy. It ought all be easy. Christ has won the victory. The land was Abraham's. Why did they have to walk it? Why did they have to drive out enemies? God said, I'll drive them out. But you got to go put your foot there. In Exodus, uh, let me say this. God wants a people and God wants a place and God wants a land. God has a land, I should say. And he wanted a people to occupy that land and to drive out all the idol worshipers and all the false gods that were in that land. A place where his people occupied and gave him the true worship that he is worthy of. That was one of the things that God wanted for his people. And one of the things he said in Exodus chapter 23 which later I want to turn to Exodus 23 and take a look at it. As he said this, as the people walked into the land and God gave them instruction in Exodus 23, verse 13, he said, take heed to all that I said to you, to all the instruction that I gave you, and make no mention of the names of the other gods, nor let such be heard out of your mouth. 
Interesting verse. Sometimes we look around us. Sometimes we look at things that we deal with and struggle with. You see, the difficult part of what I'm talking about here today, about the enemies, is some of the enemies that we face, they're not just enemies in Iran. They are there. They're not just enemies over there. There are enemies that we face right here. And they, they want to speak to us. They want to talk to us. They want to stand up sometimes. They want to show themselves strong. They want to say, I own this land. I've been here for a long time. I'm big, and you have no right to this land. That's what they want to say. God said to Abraham and to his descendants, he said, that's your land. It didn't matter that there was other people living in it. It didn't matter that there was giants in the land. God said, Abraham, that's your land. It didn't matter that the children of Israel we're in captivity for, I think it was maybe 500 years, I'm not sure. God said, that's your land. And then he spoke to Joshua, and he said, Joshua, you go. Wherever your foot steps, that's your land. And furthermore, as you go, Don't even make a mention of the name of the gods of the people that are occupying this land. It's not theirs, they're just occupying it. Don't even let their name come out of your lips. Don't let it be heard out of your mouth. I was challenged. Some not too long ago, I was speaking with Brother Wayne, and I was experiencing. Try to, uh, I want to, I want to try to, to to show you something here. I, I, I was speaking with Brother Wayne about a certain problem I was experiencing in my body, actually in my foot. And as I was talking to him about the problem that I had. Well, I'll just say what it was. I, have a prob I had a problem with gout, which is very painful, as some of you know. Um, and as I was speaking to Wayne, uh, the, what I said, I'm even hesitating to say this. I, I'll say it like this. I called it my gout. That might seem like an insignificant thing. You know what I just did there? I gave it place in my foot. And Wayne challenged me on that. I'm not even sure what the words that were that he spoke anymore. But I appreciated it, and he corrected me. That's not mine. It might be occupying a place. Actually, it's gone. It hasn't bothered me. It started to leave. It hasn't bothered me now for quite a while. In the name of Jesus, that's not mine. This body belongs to the Lord. And it's to be occupied by His presence. This person, this body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and was made to be occupied by the glory of God and by His presence, by His holiness, and by His purity. 
And there's things that we sometimes experience or go through or struggle with. And because we struggle with them, we want to become downcast. Or because we see them, we want to become downcast. They may be occupying. Listen, brothers and sisters, you might be facing something. You might be looking at a struggle. You might be saying, this is something I've had. Your body is to be a temple of the Lord, of the Holy Spirit. It's a place for Him to occupy. It's a place for you to hear Him. Be careful the words you let come out of your mouth. Maybe there's a struggle that your father or your mother experienced or your family has experienced. And maybe it's a struggle that you're also experiencing. Don't own it. Do you say, well, that's the way my father's been. That's the way that I am. I'll just always be this way. There's a land. It's God's land. There's a promise. Now see, the children of Israel went into this land. And as soon as they stepped across the Jordan River, there the commander of the, of the, Lord, the Lord of hosts, the commander of the army, met them. The enemies didn't all just run out of the land. In fact, in fact, I'll, I'll turn to Exodus chapter 23. I want to read there a little bit. Exodus chapter 23. I want to read there a little bit, portion of Scripture. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine, listen to this, I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee unto the Amorites, unto the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off, all the ites. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill, or you will live a good long life. I will send my fear before thee, and I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto me. I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before thee. Now verse 29. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate, and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee, until thou be increased and inherit the land. I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert unto the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me, for if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. Joshua, when he entered the land, was around 70 years old when he was leading the children of Israel across the Jordan River. And then on, as you know, the Battle of Jericho and how he overthrew the, 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 uh, the city of Jericho. He was about 70 years old. Later on at the end of Joshua, it says that Joshua was 110 when he passed away. And he gave instruction to the children of Israel yet as he was there coming to the end of his life. And he talked to the children of Israel. And one of the things he said, it says it in the beginning of Joshua and it says it again at the end of Joshua. He said, now he said, now be strong, be strong. The beginning of Joshua, it says, the Lord instructed Joshua, and he said, Joshua, you be strong and you be of good courage. There's some things that you're going to face as you go into this land, so be strong. Be strong and have good courage. 
When things look bad, remember that I'm the Lord God. I'm the deliverer. When things look good, remember that you're lying, relying on me. The end of Joshua, and again, it says, he says, Joshua says to the people, he said, now be strong. He said, there's still enemies to be cast out of the land. We've occupied a lot of land here, Joshua told the people. We've thrown out a lot of enemy. But he said, now be strong yet, there's still some enemy that needs to be overthrown. There's still some that got to go. Joshua started at 70. He was 110 or 111 when he passed away. And that was his word to the people when he passed away. Oh, what's, my, what's the point that I'm making with this here? It's a land of milk and honey. The enemies don't just all just get up and run away. But it's not their land. Listen, you may have something you've struggled with. Seems like maybe you're defeated with. But if you're a child of God, don't make a covenant with it. Don't agree with it. Don't say it's mine. Don't say there's nothing I can do. Recognize it for the enemy that it is and tell it that it's not, that you're not its land. It may occupy. Don't be discouraged. You see, sometimes we forget the past victories, the past deliverances that the Lord has led us through, the things that he's done in us, the enemies that have gone out of the land. Because we're still seeing some enemies that maybe are occupying some places, but it's not their land. It's not theirs. And be careful of the words that come out of your mouth lest you give it to them. Don't make agreements with them. It's not their land. God said here in Exodus chapter 23, he said, I'm not going to drive them out right away. I don't understand all of this, but this is what God told Moses. And this is what he did. He said, I'm not going to just drive them all out right away. In fact, I'm going to leave them there, and they're going to take care of the land for you until you get there. Lest it become desolate and the beasts take over. So you just, now I don't understand that. I don't have anything to say about that or how that is in our life. It's just what God told Moses. He said, they'll take care of it for you, and then when you get there, you can chase them out, and the land is yours. I'm sure there's something in there for us, but I just, I don't know what it is. So don't be discouraged if you see some giants. The land is not theirs. It's not for them. Make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let such be heard out of your mouth. You know, I know that we live in a time when there's turmoil, there's things that have happened that I've never seen before in my lifetime and so on. Children of Israel experienced some things as they went into the land that they'd never seen before. But God said, your focus and your concentration is not to be on who they are. It's to be on me. It's to be on who I am. It's to be on my word. It's to be on the victory of Christ. Not on who those false gods are. In fact, he said to them, don't even let it come out of your mouth. Be ye perfect. Be ye perfect. Going back to Hebrews chapter 6 there, it says, going on unto perfection. So what does perfection mean? Because we're scared of that word. Oh, I'm not perfect. Oh, no. Oh, I'm not perfect. Well, then go on unto perfection. Go on unto perfection. We have a wrong understanding of perfection. I believe we do, according to what this word is here. God spoke several different things. In fact, it says in numerous places. It says, it talks about perfection. Jesus said that we are to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. 
He said to a man that came to him, he said, if you will be perfect, give everything away that you have. Give it to others. Then come follow me. Ephesians 4 says that he's called people in the church with gifts till we come to a perfect man. Timothy says that the word of God is given to us, that we can study it, that we can apply it to our life, that the man of God may be perfectly furnished, thoroughly furnished. So what is perfect? As my children were growing up, going to school, they went through different grades in school, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, on through high school. And in the different grades they were in, they accomplished things for where they were at. And sometimes they had a perfect score for where they were. But where they were in second grade was not where they should have been in eighth grade. But for second grade, it was perfect. But when they came to eighth grade, it wouldn't have been perfect. The word perfect here, in the way that it's used, I think most of the way that it's used in the Bible, the word perfect is going on unto a place of maturity, coming to a place of completeness. It's not talking, friends, it's not talking about coming to a place where you never make a mistake, where you never have a failure, where you never stumble, where you never somehow trip on something, where you never ever make a mistake, where you never need the blood of Jesus. It's not what it's talking about. But coming to a place of fullness and understanding of going on in Jesus Christ. In fact, as I get towards the end of the message, I'll explain a little bit more what I see in the word perfect. That there is a perfection of the saints. But it's not what our human understanding is. And because of it at times, we look at other people and we look at things that happen to them. And maybe they're looking at a giant in their land. We say, wow, what's happening there? But for where they're at in life, they're perfect. Now, I'm not, you understand, you know me. I'm in no way condoning sin or justifying wrong behavior but also understand some of the Christian life. Going on unto maturity, what is God looking for? What is God looking for? What does he want to see? I've chosen here today to talk about three men and then concentrate on one. The Bible says that Noah was a righteous man and he was perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. King Asa says Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. It says, was said that at the end of his life. And then it says the Bible speaks of David and kings. It says that David's heart was perfect before the Lord. And had said this of David in Solomon's time. Spoke of Solomon, says that Solomon's heart was not perfect like David's was all of his days. The Bible speaks this of David after David had passed off the scene, after all these men had passed off the scene. It says that these men were perfect. And yet Noah was a man that after he built the ark, went through the flood and, the, and, and again came out on dry land and after that, that he planted a vineyard out of the fruit of it, drank the wine of it, became drunk. And as you know the story, his son Ham saw him naked. I don't need to go into all those details. And yet the Bible says of Noah that he was perfect. Asa was a man a king was a good king. Yet towards the end of his life, he relied on the Syrians and made an agreement with them to go into battle with them. And the Lord was displeased with it. And yet after that, it says that Asa was a perfect man. That he was perfect before the Lord. And then David. So you know the story of David. David. David was at a place where he saw Bathsheba. His 
saw her bathing up on a housetop, and committed adultery with her. She became pregnant. Now he was in a now he was in a fix. So what did he do? He had her husband Uriah the Hittite. He was out on the battlefield fighting, had him come back, tried to make it look like she was pregnant by her husband. It didn't work. So finally, he had Uriah put out into the battlefront. This was David. Put him in a place that was most dangerous and Uriah was killed. It's not a pretty picture. Some time later, Nathan the prophet came to David. He gave him the parable of the man, the poor man with the lamb. And David was displeased and full of indignation at the man and said, who is this man? And Nathan said to David, said, the man is you. You're the man. You're the man. David's heart was exposed. David said, I have sinned before the Lord. He repented and he hid nothing. He fell on his face before the Lord. God forgave him. And God called him, after the end of his life, God called him perfect. And he was. What does God see? What is he looking for? He sees something in David, something in Noah. And there's others that the Bible mentions. I just picked those three. A perfect heart. A perfect heart is searchable. You notice when David was confronted by Nathan the prophet, there's different things that he could have said. He could have said, well, I was just tempted beyond what I could bear. Well, he could have said, well, it, Bathsheba wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. When David was confronted with his sin, he had no excuse. Or he offered no excuse. He said, it's me. And later he cried, oh God, oh search me, try me, know what's in my heart, look at me. And I believe what God really wants to search. Oh, we see the things that we do and we're so quick to make an excuse, we're so quick to say, well, yeah, but if he wouldn't have said that, then I wouldn't have done this. Or if she wouldn't have done this, then I wouldn't have said that. And God searches the heart, it says, and he looks down not at what you say, but why you say what you say. And he looks in the motive. He looks down into the heart. David was a searchable man. He desired the searching of the Lord. Oh, to be searched by him with the, with the eyes, by the way of the Holy Spirit and the Scripture to be open and to see what the Bible says and to allow it to be a mirror to us and to look and to shine on our life. David was a searchable man. He said, it's me. It's me. Saul also was confronted by the prophet Samuel, 
for not killing all of the, as he was commanded. Saul's response was, it was the people. It was the people. They wanted to keep it. And I didn't want to, I, I didn't, it was the people. David's response was, it's me, O oh Lord. It is I. And he repented there. It's a searchable heart. It's a trusting heart. It's a heart that trusts. It trusts in obedience. It trusts when circumstances come that we don't understand, that we trust, we still trust that God sees and that God knows and that he's in control. David said, in thee have I put my trust. If you remember the story of when David, David counted the people, David made mistakes. He made mistakes. He counted the people at one point, and God was displeased with him. God was very unhappy with him because he counted the people. He numbered the people. And, and, the, and the prophet came to David and said, David, you have three choices. I could put you into the hand of an enemy to go into battle. I could send a plague from the Lord. And now I can't remember what the third one was. But it was, it was something else. And David said, I will put myself in the hands of the Lord because I know that he's a merciful God. I will trust him more than going into battle with enemies because I know he's a merciful God. And God sent a plague and 70,000 men died. It's the trusting heart of David. To trust means to throw oneself in the Hebrew word it means to throw oneself off of a precipice or off of a cliff and to entirely give oneself into someone else's hands and to trust. To trust. It means, as I believe it was the Moravians, I'm not sure, maybe the Moravians, there were men that sold all that they had and sold themselves into the hands of slavers to go over to minister to slaves, and they had no recourse, and they threw themselves into the hands of God to direct their life, because that's what they knew, that God was speaking to them at that moment in that place in history. And they trusted that God would deliver them or take them where he wanted them to be. It means to come to places where we surrender in the occupying of this land where the enemies have to go, that we come to places where we come to places of death, where we say people will not understand, but I give myself to do what you're asking me to do, Lord, and to walk with you because you've called me to do it. That was David's heart. And it was a perfect heart before the Lord. The whole burnt offering, there's another element or aspect to this that I want to get to. A perfect heart is also a broken heart, a heart that follows the Lord at all costs. That was the heart of David. The whole burnt offering. In Leviticus, the instruction was that a man could bring for a, to for, a, for a sacrifice either a bullock or a ram or they could bring a, a dove. There was different things that they could bring. And they would bring it to the tabernacle to make atonement for sin, to have an, a sacrifice that was to be laid on the altar and there to be burned up. And they were to bring it the, to the front gate of the tabernacle, and there it says that the priest would slay the animal on the north side of the altar, and the blood would be spilled on the ground, and then they would skin the animal, and they would cut it into pieces. And that animal was then offered on the brazen altar as a sacrifice and an atonement for sin, for the man's sin. Before the man would do that, he would lay his hands on the head of the ox or whatever that he brought, and there the sin would be transferred 
And the animal would be put onto the altar. It would be quartered, laid onto that altar. I believe it was washed before all of that. It would be cut into pieces, washed, and then laid onto that altar. And then it would be burned up entirely by the flame that was on that altar that would continually burn. But it was very important. It was called a whole burnt offering. A whole burnt offering. And it was never good enough if the man would have decided, well, you know what? I've got this nice ox here. It's really good. It's got some good fillets in there. You know what I think I'll do? I think I'll butcher it, and maybe I'll take that hind quarter and I'll take it over to the tabernacle. And I think I'll take those fillets there and those tenderloins, and I think I'll, I'll keep those for myself. No, what God was looking for is he was looking for a whole burnt offering for that entire animal to be taken. Didn't matter whether it was a dove, whether it was a ram, or whether it was an ox. He wanted that whole burnt offering laid onto that altar and burned up and consumed in the flame of that altar. And there it ascended. It burned up, and then it ascended into the heavens, the smoke, And God smelt that. A perfect heart, a whole burnt offering. Is a heart that in completeness throws itself into the arms of God to love Him, to serve Him, to pursue Him, to seek after Him. Wholeheartedness is what God is looking for. He's not looking for half-hearted Christians. And believe me, I understand that we come to places we come to places that are difficult Places of bruising, places of hurt, places of failure, like David did. God's not looking for perfection in the human sense. That's not what he's looking for. He's not looking for you to walk your walk as a Christian ever so carefully. In fact, it's not possible. Give it up. But ever so carefully. And then becoming so downcast when we make a mistake. There's enemies that have to be thrown out yet. But our concentration is not on them. It is on the Lord, the Redeemer. And what he is looking for, my friends, is he's looking for wholeheartedness. He's looking for people who have thrown their hearts into his hands. Are you a newborn Christian? Or wherever you're at in your Christian life, he's looking for wholeheartedness. He's looking for people that are listening for his his voice and are willing to walk the way that he wants them to walk by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Things come, things go. Hurts come, hurts go. Things happen. And in some of those times, maybe with our wholeheartedness, all we can manage is to fall before the face of God and say, God, keep me in this moment. Hold me in this moment. Maybe at some times that's all that wholeheartedness means. But in all honesty, you come before the Lord and you open up your heart and you pour out to Him there what's in your heart. Because that's what he wants. He doesn't want lip service. You see, Ananias and Sapphira, they came there. And at that moment, what was going on there, people were selling their things because the power of God was working and the love of God was moving in their hearts and they were selling their things and the things that they had and they were coming and saying, here, here's what I've had. And they gave it to the apostles and it was distributed among the people. Ananias and Sapphira saw this. So, well, that's, people are getting recognition. And so they had a piece of land. A 
and they sold it. It was theirs. But then they came to the apostles, to Peter, and they said, here's the money for the land. Peter asked him, says, it's all the money. He said, yes, it's all the money. What was going on there? And then as you know the story, they were both struck down dead. And Peter, I think Peter said, I didn't really look at this, but Peter said to them, he said, it was your land. You didn't have to sell it. It was yours. You didn't have to give us all the money. But you lied to the Holy Spirit. You tried to act like you gave all of it and you didn't. Your lips are saying one thing, but your heart's not in it. You want the recognition of man, but you don't want the honesty before the Lord. God's not fooled. And they were struck dead. I believe, and I understand it this way, that God would rather have you come before him and say, I really don't want to give this, and I'm only going to give half of it, than pretend like you're doing something that you're not. God wants honesty. But he wants a whole heart. He wants a complete heart. He wants a complete person. He doesn't want you just on Sunday. He doesn't just want you in the morning and a little in the evening. He wants you all the time. He wants a whole heart. A whole burnt offering is a perfect part. A heart that is complete in giving itself to God. Not a heart that never makes a mistake. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12 and 13. It's talking about the new covenant. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me. If the worship team would come up, I'm going to wrap up here very shortly. This is the, the new covenant. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. With all of your heart. I've come to places already, places of despair, places of failure, places of mistakes, places of disgust. You know, and you come to the Lord and you try to pray a prayer that you think you ought to pray. Been there. And maybe you begin with, Oh God, thou great God. Well, that's all right. Those are good words. And it seems like I'm not getting through. And you know, there's times you just come and say, You know what? I need help. This is who I am. This is what I've done. God wants an honest heart. He wants a whole heart. He's not looking for your perfect work. He's looking for an honest, pure, and a sincere heart. It's the heart that he hears when you seek him that way. <clears throat> Jeremiah 32, verse 39 and 41, And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. Verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will, listen to this verse, this is the covenant that we have in Christ. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. I will put my fear into their hearts and they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. That's what God has done. He has with his whole heart and with his whole soul, he has given himself in the way of Christ. There is not more that God will do or can do than what he has already done in giving us himself through Jesus. Completely throwing himself to us in that sense with open arms on a cross and saying, whosoever will may come, come to me for your weary, when you're heavy laden, when you're burdened down with, 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 with guilt or condemnation or sin, come to me and I'll relieve your burden. Just give me your heart. I want your heart. I want your love. I want who you are. I don't want your perfect words. I don't want you to walk you have all your perfect works to do so perfectly in everything. I want your heart. This is the covenant 
that God has made with us through Christ. Hebrews chapter 10. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Going on into perfection. Going on unto perfection is going on into a greater and a greater maturity in Christ which means a greater reliance on the blood of Jesus, a greater reliance on who Christ is, a greater reliance on His righteousness and on His perfection, a greater dependence on Him. My friends, we never ever come to a place in this life of a Christian and walking in this world and going and occupying this land that He has called us to occupy. Every step of the way, is with a greater and a greater dependence on the work of Christ, on the blood of Jesus Christ. And oh, lest we misunderstand and think that this life of perfection that God has called us into is somehow a life of perfecting the human flesh and effort because it's not. The longer I walk, the more I walk with Him, the more I understand the weakness of my own being, my own nature, and that I need a greater and a greater reliance on Him. It's the perfection of Christ. It's a greater reliance on the blood. And we have boldness to enter in there. A boldness to enter in to the very holiest by the blood of Jesus. By the work of Christ. And that we have a high priest who is over the house of God. His name is Jesus. And that we can have a boldness. And the word boldness here means this. It means that we can come to Him with outspokenness. That we don't have to come pretending. Pretending to be someone that we're not. Or saying just the right words in the right way. But that we can come with a boldness and an open face to the high priest. What He wants is He wants your whole heart. He wants a completeness of you. Not half here, half over there. That's a miserable way to live the Christian life. But he wants a whole heart. Christian life takes courage. It takes courage. It takes faith, it takes courage, and a continual reliance on the blood of Jesus that has been shed and is ever sufficient. There's a land that is a land of promise that Jesus has redeemed and purchased for us, a land of living in Him and living by the promises. And don't ever let the enemy tell you that it is his land, because it is not. The price has been paid. And captivity has been taken captive. Christian life takes courage. And sometimes we come to places we're not sure we have any courage. 
But I'm so glad for the redeeming power of Christ. In the last year, I've been to places, as I mentioned, I think, last Saturday night. Where I wasn't sure where my faith was or my strength or my hope. And in those times, we throw ourselves into the hands of God. And like I said, sometimes we can only whisper, keep me, Lord. And that mustard seed of faith sometimes almost seems to go underground where there seems to be so little evidence and there it springs up again and grows because it's the life of Jesus. It's not my life. He has come into my life. He's come into your life. Trust Him. Give him your whole heart. That's a perfect heart. Maybe you've made a failure, a mistake, whatever it might have been, or a hurt that you've experienced that looks like such a, such a big enemy. It's not their land. It's the property of God's property. It's the property of Jesus Christ. He has redeemed it. Remember that. It's not their land. Brother Matt.